Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session of the PERMET webinar series. Uh, today, uh, Miroslav uh, Katoshvil is going to talk about uh, analysis of huge metabolic models with Corexa. My name is Daniel Tomas Lopez. I am involved in PERMET on behalf of Embol EBI, and I am going to host this webinar. Before starting, I would like to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded, including the questions and answers section, and that the recording will be disseminated afterwards. After the presentation, we will have time for questions. So please use the Q&A button in your Zoom panel for asking questions during the webinar. Permit COE, it's the HPC Exascale Center of Excellence for Personalized Medicine in Europe. PERMET focuses on simulation of cellular mechanistic models, which are essential to translate omic data into medical actions. The performance of cell simulation software is still not enough to address problems such as tumor evolution or to provide personalized treatments to patients uh, nowadays. So PERMET COE will scale up the software for cell simulations to the present uh, HP6 scale systems in order to enable the creation of models of cellular functions of medical relevance. PERMET will achieve this goal through a series of objectives. First, it will optimize uh, cell-level simulation software to run in PEXA-scale platforms. Second, PERMET is developing a series of use cases that will showcase the applications of PERMET products in different fields of clinical interest, such as drug synergies for cancer treatments, or performing multi-scale modeling of COVID-19 virus and patient's tissue. Additionally, PERMET also has as objectives training the biomedical professionals in the use of HP6 scale PERMET tools, integrating the PERMET communities into the European HPC scale ecosystem, and building the basis for the sustainability of PERMET. Let me now introduce our speaker, Miroslav Kartosvi. Uh, Miroslav recently uh, finished his PhD in computer science at Charles University in Prague. Currently, he's a researcher focusing on bioinformatics oriented topics at Luxembourg Center for Systems Biomedicine. His research concerns mainly the high performance algorithms for processing large data sets from large life sciences. So, uh, Miroslav, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Daniel. I I hope that everyone can hear me. We can, yes. Perfect. So I will try to share the screen and I guess we can start. Oh, good. Uh, okay, so this is it. Welcome to the webinar. Welcome to the uh, well short presentation of the analysis of huge metabolic models with Cobrex out of JL. Uh, as you have probably noticed, I've just noticed that I get a mistake in the slides. Hopefully this is not going to repeat very uh, often. Uh, as Daniel said, I'm a kind of fresh postdoc at LSCSB and Cobrexa and development of this uh, modeling tool is basically my uh, uh, well main uh, volume of the work. Uh, the release of Cobrexa was basically one of our primary tasks within the ARC well, within, within the Permat COI project. Uh, in this talk, I kind of hope to give you a bit of the overview of what is the what is the reasoning, what is the reason why we develop these two, why we ex so why we specially focus on uh, modeling of constraint-based models. Uh, I will give a brief overview of how to start with Cobrexa, how to start with the metabolic modeling in Julia. Uh, if you are new to Julia, if you are new into well. Uh, using of these packages, you should get a quick start and some pointers on how to get started, how to uh, uh, will do something useful very quickly. Um, I should focus today, especially on one main, main thing, uh, which is how Cobrexa.jl actually differs from the other packages that are in the ecosystem. Uh, uh, the main difference here is uh, basically that it is kind of constructed for uh, running on HPC and running on the pre infrastructure that we have now available uh, very easily, uh, one of the main topics for the development was basically to make uh, the workflows that you can construct as a biologist, as a scientist, very easily uh, portable uh, to the HPC infrastructure, running faster, gaining more performance and producing more results, of course. And the second main uh, distinction there is that we kind of try to construct Cobrex so that the construction of new, metab uh, new metabolic processing, new metabolic model analysis is easy. 
um, because we kind of separated it to a small building boss that can be fairly combined and actually do a nice uh, job in kind of letting you to specify uh, very advanced aliases very easily. Uh, so that is what I'm going to show you and uh, hopefully uh, uh, you will get a clear picture of how to do it and how to use it and how to well employ it for your analysis on your uh, well, science research. Uh, so yeah, let's start with what's and why. So let's talk about what we are going to use. I'm going to give a brief overview of what the, what the metabolic modeling or and with constraint based models is about. Uh, this, this shortcut here, COBRA, is constraint based reconstruction analysis. Uh, here we are mostly going to be talking about the analysis part. The reconstruction part is uh, well concerns the um, well practice of describing the organisms that live uh, and have some biochemical, biochemical reactions in them as constraint-based models. In the constraint-based model, you usually have a set of reactions that consume and produce the metabolites. You can imagine the whole thing, for example, like this like a set of reactions that import some metabolite. I got the metabolites marked here as A and B and C and D. And uh, the metabolites get transformed. For example, this reaction transforms one molecule, probably of A to one molecule of C. This reaction transforms three molecules of B into uh, plus one molecule of C into D. Uh, some reactions are usually used to mark or simulate the imports of all well, uh, kind of ingestions of metabolites into the cells or into the organisms. For example, this organism, well, very simple organism, uh, can be seen to import a, a metabolite A and B, uh, do something with them and produce metabolite X. Uh, you can usually place some constraints on the reaction rates because you want to do that. For example, several, some reactions do, cannot be run uh, reversely, some reactions cannot be run very quickly because I don't know, the organism probably does, wouldn't have enough resources to do that. And what you usually want in this kind of modeling is that you require the system, require this system of reactions and metabolic transformations to reach a steady state, uh, which means that uh, you are finding a solution for this kind of model where all the reactions are running at proper rates, proper speeds, so that uh, there are no metabolites that would be increasing in, uh, in concentration or in volume in the long term and no metabolites that would be missing in the long term. So uh, basically all the, all the productions and consumptions of the reactions times their rates uh, would sum up to zero. Uh, this process is a pretty nice uh, mathematical well, model or visualization. You can actually write this uh, you can actually write this uh, schema as a matrix where you put reactions in columns, so uh, metabolites in rows, so then you model directions, for example, reaction number three here as something that is consuming metabolite A and producing metabolite C, like this one. And if you uh, continue looking at the mathematically, you can actually uh, specify all these, all these uh, requirements we had here as a very simple linear algebra. Uh, you take X as a vector of reaction rates, this is called a flux, and uh, you require that the sum of the, uh, sum of the uh, entries in the, in the stoichiometry matrix uh, multiplied by the flux, which is basically the amount of metabolites that get consumed and produced in total is zero, so that no metabolites kind of, you know, uh, get overproduced or underproduced or will be missing in time. And also that uh, the flux satisfies the bounds that you put uh, on it, for example, that no reactions uh, work in the reverse and no reactions work too quickly, which, which would be unrealistic in the nature. Uh, if you are into mathematics and linear algebra, you can probably see that this is a trivial solution. You can just freeze the metabolism of the organism. It wouldn't do anything. It would satisfy these bounds. So additionally, you actually require the system or require the organism to do something meaningful like growing or producing something that it needs to grow, like breathing or something. So you usually add a objective uh, to this metabolic model, uh, which is usually represented by a vector of scores for the reactions. So you require the model to actually maximize this reaction, which is biologically relevant because the organism, organisms usually require uh, maximization of, for example, the growth or metabolic rate to actually succeed in the nature. And if you solve this model, as a constraint problem, I'm oh, sorry. If you solve this model as a constraint problem, you will get some uh, you will get some information about how the organism can actually work, how the organism can actually arrange itself internally to reach the uh, steady state and the survive. Uh, 
why we started the development of Cobrexa, um, this metabolic modeling is quite important for simulating and seeing what is happening in living cells, seeing what is happening in microbiomes, in bacteria, in soil. And the situation back in 2020, uh, when we actually were starting planning the development, was uh, not bad because there were many packages that contain very good implementation of the methods uh, for actually working with these models. Uh, for example, this is what I shown there, the maximization of the objective in with subject to constraints called uh, flux balance analysis. Uh, there are many other methods for seeing the variability of direction rates for something, direction space, um, for, for, for processing the models with many additional constraints, for example, on the realistic balance between direction rates in the organism. Uh, there is, for example, Cobra Toolbox and Cobra Pi that can help you run uh, these analyses very nicely. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the models are now consist of thousands and thousands of reactions, and the model growth continues naturally because we are getting better equipment, better better methods to actually gather the model information and will produce bigger bigger models. And it turned out that the simple hardware, like a single computer, wasn't very easily uh, able to accommodate the analysis volumes anymore. So we needed to uh, parallelize this and distribute this over multiple nodes with multiple computation center, or, sorry, uh, multiple computation nodes, multiple computers, basically, and uh, make sure that it can be scaled up uh, with the availability of hardware and HPC that we have. So uh, yeah, this is a picture of how quickly the models grow. We have the models of bacteria, which were produced well in the 1990s, which have around 1,000 reactions. And if you add a bit of complexity to the organism, also to the uh, model gathering method, you start getting meta genomic models that may have five uh, or 500 million, so more, even more uh, individual reactions that uh, might be a serious problem for uh, normal computers to handle. Uh, so uh, the design motivation for Cobrexa was to basically enable this uh, parallelization of the task that we have here uh, in a kind of a higher overview of uh, the usual view on the on the analysis is this you got some analysis specification what do you want to do with the model uh, for example you want to compute the variability of directions you want to examine each direction in uh, separately uh, which gives you a large number of tasks uh, you can throw this code to the computer and you will get results uh, unfortunately, if you throw a large amount of tasks to a single computer, you will get very, very um, unpleasant timing of the uh, of, you know, when you get the result. Uh, for example, in a very, very well demonstrational analysis that I well dreamed up for you with wait ten hours on a single computer, uh, the target for uh, Cobrex is to take this and make it very scalable to much more computers uh, parallelly. Uh, Ideally, uh, if you parallelize this correctly, if everything well, or works well, then if you uh, basically divide the time required on one computer, you would get the five minutes that you can uh, get the results on uh, well, using this amount of computers. Um, so this is the primary reason for Cobrex development. Uh, these think of uh, basically distributing your workload, uh, distributing your task set uh, to be computed on multiple computers should be easy for researchers to do. Uh, the problem is technical because we don't want to re-implement all the uh, analyses that are already implemented in the uh, in the other packages, and we would also want to do something for the future, like making sure that uh, well, researchers who make up new analyses, researchers who need to uh, implement something new, don't need to dream about, uh, don't need to work about uh, on uh, like you know recreating the parallelism parallelization algorithms in their own software all, all over again. Uh, so Cobrexa is a kind of systematic solution to the problem uh, that tries to make the implementation of the parallel and distributed Cobra analysis a bit easier. And the approach that we took is, uh, I guess, pretty straightforward. Uh, well, basically uh, follows the scheme that I was showing before. If you look at the common analysis that is large scale that has this uh, pro problem with volume, uh, then most of the large analyzers share kind of a common shape. Uh, you usually start with a model, which might be big, it might be a community model, it might be actually a con well, community of many models. Uh, you explore some variations of the model, like do tiny modifications, like knockout genes, uh, add some other uh, organisms into the model. Then you run various analyzers algorithms on the model versions you got, which again multiplies the workload. And then you want to kind of wrap it up uh, 
collect the result and see the result as something simple, which is kind of the reducing final step. And Cobrex does precisely this uh, using many functions that are implemented there. Uh, the main uh, kind of distinctive uh, distinctive property of Cobrex is all these functions like making community models, loading models, or knock, knocking out genes, running flux variable analysis, running samplings, and screening for model variants for something, collecting the results are made as a building blocks that can be very easy to combine and taken apart and recombine again. Uh, also, you can add more new functionality to do that and you can combine the new ways that we didn't expect. So it kind of uh, solves the problem with implementation of uh, the new analysis method just by allowing the people to uh, use the prepare building blocks and recombine them again into something that uh, is meaningful and makes sense for their analysis. Uh, okay, that's it for the motivation. I guess uh, we should start very quickly with how to get the Cobra exhaust software running, and then I can show you uh, what is the actual distinctive property and how to uh, how to get it. Uh, if you never worked with Julia, if you never worked with Cobra Exa, actually starting out is well not complicated. Uh, Usually you start with downloading and install Julia, uh, Julia program language, uh, then you install the Cobra Exagel package, which is itself very easy. Uh, this may take 10 minutes. Uh, then we will uh, need to find and download some models that we can play with. And uh, then I will show how to run a very basic analysis on the model and uh, see some results, uh, see how it actually behaves and see how, what is the steady state of that. Uh, the common question we are getting be like why, why would we be starting with a new program language as if you know as if bioinformatics wouldn't have already 10 program languages that are you know, kind of fighting for the space on the sound for with between each other. Um, we actually wanted to start with Julia because of some properties that uh, it has and uh, most other program languages that are being used now are kind of, kind of do not have that. Uh, one of the most uh, important ones, and actually one of the most I like, uh, one of these that I like most is that uh, Julia is actually compiled language and heavily optimized, uh, which is nice because you got a language that looks like Python, uh, can be used like Python or R. It's kind of intuitive to people, but it's well for a small code that you sometimes need to wait for a bit of compilation. It runs tremendously fast, especially in comparison with Python and R. Uh, it's got some side benefits, like there are very good packages for all kinds of uh, numeric computing, for linear optimization, for solving uh, solving the nonlinear problems, neural networks, machine learning, everything. Uh, one critical property for us is that the parallelization is easy because Julia built, was built with parallelization in mind, so there are no problems like the global interpreter log in Python. And uh, one thing that is, well, probably not a very good property of the language, but it is property of our time, time now, the language is quite young and doesn't pack as much uh, like, you know, historical problems and craft as, for example, Python, especially R. So, uh, well, if you are using it, you are very unlikely to hit very weird problems that have very weird solution out of historical reasons. You can actually read a lot of, about the language on julialang.org. Uh, installing Julia is super simple. Uh, on Linux or Unix, you just use your package manager on Windows you download from the website of Simon Mac. On HPCs, on the comp uh, well, uh, high performance infrastructure, you would have it is usually pre installed. If not, you probably need to consult your system administrator, but there's usually no problem with installing that. Uh, if you want to start with that, you should be able to somehow execute Julia interpreter and get this tiny little prompt that asks you for the command like this. Um, if you don't know language right now, that might be a problem because uh, you might get lost in the uh, in the rest of the webinar. On the other hand, if you know any other program language that kind of touches the bioinformatics, such as R and Python or MATLAB, uh, then Julia is actually made to be very similar to those and very intuitive to the actual users of the program languages now. Uh, there is a small code sample that you might be able to read even if you know a tiny bit of R and a tiny bit of MATLAB. Uh, there are some properties that you probably know from R, like RNG specified by colon. There are some properties that you might know from MATLAB, like the vectorized operations with, with dot. And there might be some properties that you know from Python uh, that I cannot see now, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, four cycles of this thing. Uh, there are some nice properties of language, especially this actual overloading, unlike unlike the other bioinformatics languages that are now. 
Uh, if you need to know something more about Julia, if you need to learn it, uh, if you would like to learn it, you can actually very easily scan uh, this QR code here and go to Julia tutorial, which is a nice learning resource. Uh, I'm not going to give overview of Julia. I'm kind of hoping that all code I'm going to present here will be intuitive also for the users of the other languages. Uh, and once you have Julia, you can actually install Cobrexa very quickly. You just hit the special shortcut for the packaging interface of the of the of the interpreter, the right bracket, type at Cobrexa, and you should get Cobrexa. Uh, in a total result, uh, if you see a screen like this where you're on Julia, then uh, run, uh, then you can type using Cobrexa, which actually loves the package, and you got this Cobrexa logo and uh, prompt with logic well, the Cobrexa, then you should be good to go with the rest of the webinar. Uh, for the models, I will use the kind of, uh, it's not canonical, I guess, but it's, uh, well, the best model to play with. I will be using the E. coli core model, which is available from here on this QR code. Uh, there are many other models that you can very readily use with uh, Cobrexa, for example, the models from uh, this repository, models from big models from biomodels, uh, models from virtual metabolic human that we actually use for uh, one uh, benchmark of Cobrexa. There are many, uh, there's, for example, the models of the gut microbiome, which is very interesting. Uh, for the rest of the tutorial, I will use the simple, simplified model, but actually well, all other models from here will work because they are in the standard formats. We support both the XML, which is SBML here, and JSON, so everything should be loadable. Uh, uh, okay, let's jump to programming. Uh, the quick start for working with the models looks like this. Uh, if you have ever used Cobra Pi or Cobra Toolbox, so this should be probably no surprise for you. There's a function which is called load model. Uh, which is uh, basically for what it says, loading the uh, loading the model that you uh, get, uh, give as a file name here to a variable, which is in Julia. Uh, this way you load the SBM model, and with the very same function, you can also load the model from JSON. Uh, one thing that you might notice is that the uh, types of the models are actually different because Cobrex has uh, many specialized model formats for many different uh, use cases. And there is actually no need to convert the models into a you know a common representation because that, that, that could be also a waste of time uh, in case the user would need to do something with the specialized SBML representation or something just on the JSON structure or something. Uh, in total, uh, you will get the models. Uh, you can have a look into models, what the models actually contain. If you want to see, for example, what the reactions are described in the model, you just use the reactions functions, which extracts a, a list of strings from the uh, list of strings from the model uh, that uh, contain the reaction names. For example, this is uh, oxygen transport, I guess. Uh, you can also get the list of metabolites that are in the model. Uh, one of these is glucose. This is probably glycine or this one. And uh, what, what is probably the most important part for uh, systems biology, you can also extract the stoichiometry of the model, which is the matrix. And in this case, uh, 72 metabolites times 95 reactions in the E. coli model. Um, uh, you can actually inspect the matrix of stoichiometry as a normal matrix. So you will get the uh, normal entries of uh, plus ones and minus ones and plus other stoichiometries in the model. You can actually compute with them manually right away. Uh, this interface here was actually a generic one, which is common for all model types that are in Cobrexa. Uh, if you like, uh, for example, the Cobra Toolbox way or Cobra Pi way of working with the models there, that is also supportive without uh, any uh, like uh, any other problems, you, you can actually uh, load the model into something that we call core model, uh, which contains a linear view of the whole metabolic problem. So it contains an actual vector of the uh, of the, for example, this is lower bounds for the matrix. So this is the vector we had there in the beginning. It also contains the stoichiometry, the stoichiometry matrix as a normal matrix that you can play with and you can assign to it and modify the model right in place. Also, if you are a user of Cobra Pi, uh, we get the standard model, so-called, uh, which behaves very roughly like uh, the model structure in Cobra Pi. So it has, for example, the subtle reactions, which contains the actual reactions. This is the dictionary of reactions uh, with reaction objects, which uh, themselves contain their own dictionaries with stoichiometries, which is roughly how Cobra Pi does it. 
And if you've got some workflow uh, implementing Kubernetes, you can actually port it very easily to this uh, representation of modular work with it right away. Uh, yeah, uh, you can access directions like this. You can access, for example, their upper bounds, which is 1000 here, almost infinity. And you can, for example, check out the subsystem of the reaction. It's a gluco gluconeogenesis, gluconeogenesis, sorry. Um, and if you want to run actual analysis, of, also this is probably not surprising, uh, you will get several functions that uh, do the analysis that you are used to. For example, the FB and FBA, this is flux balance analysis, which is finding the steady state of the model. If you run it on the E. coli model that we have loaded, you will get some uh, assignment of the uh, reaction rates, the fluxes. Uh, to the actual names of the actions, and you can, for example, see that it is uh, transporting the ammonia. Uh, I, I don't know the English name of this thing. Sorry, uh, it's transporting this thing uh, with a quite high rate. It's producing ATP. Uh, it's uh, exchanging the same thing out of uh, the external compartment, and it's uh, transporting the carbon dioxide as well, and it's growing a bit because the biomass production is is uh, zero point eight. Uh, you can also run the FBA, which is flux variability analysis, which sees how much uh, you can actually uh, increase and decrease the rate of the, each reaction. Is it the reaction minimum or reaction maximum? To in order to see the uh, in order to be able to still reach the same growth as here. Um, if you would like to explore the rest of Cobrex. There are many more analyses implemented. We got production, we also many variants of FBA, some uh, new stuff, which is overworking with enzyme capacity limit in the cells. So we got knock, no LG knockouts and so. And the target for today is just to show you how to uh, take these analyses and combine them freely into analyses that would make sense, but no, no one would uh, probably implement them in the package because you, you know they might be very uh, kind of one shot one um, for one shot usage in some analysis that is not probably even uh, you know generalizable. Um, so for example, we can kind of take the building blocks from the analysis and see, for example, the genocles have will have the greatest effect on the uh, rate growth in within the parsimonious FBA. Uh, we can do analysis of uh, gene triplets that are, for example, most or least important for the organism, uh, which is a steady state. Uh, for example, we can identify which gene triplet will uh, basically uh, cause uh, most damage to the organism if knocked out. Uh, we can also try to identify, for example, which uh, enzymes of the reactions would fill up most of the space in the cell, if uh, the cell would be constant in space and constant in actual weight and constant in actual and, uh, enzyme protein production. Uh, so uh, let's have a look at that. Um, in Cobrex, uh, we have taken a systematic approach to construct, construct in this uh, new analysis with a simple idea. We have modifications there, which are basically tiny recipes that describe a tiny change to model. Uh, you can imagine the whole thing, for example, like this. You got an original model, and you take a uh, modification, which I visualize here as kind of a pipe. Uh, you take the model through the knockout pipe, and you get the model with a tiny prime here, which has a gene knocked out. Uh, this combines very easily uh, because you can just take the modifications, for example, knockout number one, knockout number one, addition of some tiny model part to the whole model, and you can chain them uh, behind themselves and it will kind of kind of combine. It will still be one modification in the larger view that can be run and uh, that can be plugged into the functions. And what we did is that we actually made all the functions that are there in Cobrex accept this kind of modification. So you can take this large modification that I've constructed and you can plug it in the FBA, for example, and you, instead of the normal result from the FBA, you will get the result from the model that uh, will happen if the genes would be knocked out and this modification would be done as well. Um, this is done for all the functions, for example, so for the FBA, uh, sorry, FBA, where you get the modified variability of the modified model, uh, and as well for the end boats, we, where you will get the modified uh, production profile of the model, depending on this uh, modification for many others. Uh, this is very useful because you can actually express many different uh, useful things using that. Um, you don't need to you don't need to program too much because these tiny recipes in the code it looks precisely like this. 
Uh, the modification which specifies the knockout of some gene, this is some gene ID from E. coli, uh, is liter one line. And if you want to run the flexible analysis with a model, on a model that has this thing knocked out, you just run the flexible analysis, which we had there on the model that we have loaded. Uh, you need to give it some kind of optimizer. This uh, we are using the GNU linear, uh, I forget the acronym, sorry, the GLPK optimizer. And uh, you just run it and you will get the result that is uh, that is uh, produced by the organism after the gene knockout, uh, which is nice because it well, we have actually changed the whole model and changed the whole analysis in one line of code. Um, this combines very easily. Uh, if you uh, add additional modifications to the list of the modifications here, you will get more complicated model uh, with more complicated modifications applied. For example, you can change the constraint on reaction PFK, which is actually the first reaction here, uh, and put an upper bound to it, for example, 3.0. And if you run it, you will actually see that the uh, reaction will need to, will seriously be bounded to 3.0, approximately within the precision limits of the solver. And the other reactions will need to get reorganized a tiny bit uh, because you know uh, the model needs to save the metabolism somehow. It still needs to still produce optimal without without this reaction. So the other reactions will need to get reorganized a bit. Um, in the uh, higher view, it looks precisely like this. Uh, the FBA takes the model on the input, uh, then takes the model through these modifications which are here, applies them on the model uh, one after another. Uh, then computes its stuff uh, and gets you the balanced state, uh, the steady state of the organism that you get on the output. Um, this also works for the other analysis methods, for example, for the FBA here. It also works for many other parameter types, not only modifications. Uh, so what happens if you plug this into FBA? Of course, you will get the, your uh, variability on the model that you are uh, working with, the one with the gene knocked out and the reaction choked. Uh, also, there are many other kind of smaller modification functions like the gamma bounds here, which is specifying uh, in a functional way uh, the um, actual percentage of the steady, uh, sorry, uh, the percentage of the optimum of the production of the model that the uh, variability here needs to reach, uh, which is 90% in this case. Um, there are many modifications uh, implemented in uh, Cobrexa. I have shown the knockouts and change constraints. There are actually modifications for doing basically anything with the with the models, like removing reactions, removing metabolites, removing whole genes, removing whole parts of the models, adding new models to communities, removing models from communities, and so on and so on. Uh, this example here is uh, a small example that uh, actually allows you to combine something that is not very easily to you know, it is not very easy to combine programmatically manually. It actually combines the uh, um, flux variability analysis with a moment algorithm, which is an algorithm that kind of adds constraints to the model that simulate the um, uh, coding of the proteins and coding of the enzymes within the cell. Uh, so we uh, somehow limit the uh, amount of protein available for catalyzing direction in the cell here so that all uh, of the reactions are catalyzed in the same way. This is for demonstration and the maximum amount of total protein in the cell is 60% of the dry mass. And it still works because uh, this interface of uh, the modifications and, and the interface with um, of, that allows it to compute the, bit, uh, sorry, compute the variability on the model that's modified is still the same and doesn't need any uh, extra uh, care other than that you just put the modification to the list. Uh, the obvious question is how does this work? Internally, the modifications are very simple. Internal, the modifications, these tiny recipes here, for example, this knockout, uh, they are just functions. Uh, for example, this knockout here uh, returns a function that the F flux variability analysis function here can run later on the model. And actually, the function that it returns, they move the actual gene from the model for it. So uh, it's basically a wrapped piece of functionality uh, that can be transported somehow, that can be grasped, uh, that can be uh, executed later. And it kind of describes as a recipe what should be done with the model. Uh, this is important for uh, at least two reasons. Uh, one, well, number one reason is that the recipes are small and they can be actually sent very easily to remote computers, which we will tackle later. 
the second way, uh, second very important thing is that uh, specifying the uh, specifying the modifications using this kind of high level interface so looks intuitive as it's actually very intuitive and it gives you kind of a, a way to uh, approach the problem as a data structure, not as a program. Uh, that would need some kind of you know imperative linking between the commands, but uh, it seriously allows you to specify a list of the modifications that can, that can be read and reused by uh, the functions later. Uh, in particular, uh, just to finish this, if you would uh, like to implement your own modification, it's not very complicated. You just uh, make a function which returns another function that takes the model, the optimization model, uh, does something on the modernization model. This uh, something here is actually done on the jump interface of to the optimization, which is kind of Julia uh, interface to the uh, optimization problems that we are using internally on Cobrexa. Uh, when you have this function done, uh, you just put it in the modification and it will just work. In this case, it is, uh, if I remember correctly, it is taking the a variable of some index in the model. So this would be the fifth reaction that corresponds to the fifth variable on the model. And it sets the objective for the model to maximize this variable. Uh, here you take the model structure, here you take the optimization model, uh, change the thing accordingly, and you got to work in modification. Uh, the nice thing about the modification is that, well, as I said, because these are not functions or programs, these are like tangible recipes, actual data structures, uh, you can actually use them and you can use them to build larger data structures. In turn, you can use them uh, to build, for example, lists of uh, lists and matrices and vectors of modification uh, that uh, you, you can process parallelly and process en masse. Uh, which uh, makes this concept very useful because you can specify a huge vector of model variants that you want to process and just run all of them parallelly well, some function that just does it for you. Um, in Cobrexa, we got two functions that do this. One is called screen, uh, sorry, screen op optimization model modification, this is a shortcut, uh, which uh, takes the modifications and processes large amounts of modifications on a single jump optimization model for efficiency and gives the results of the analysis function for each of the modifications you pass to it. So for example, here in this, uh, here in this code snippet, uh, we are um, running a analysis on a model uh, the analysis got three parts. Uh, one of the uh, one of the analysis parts will work on the model, which has a change obje change objective to maximize this reaction. Uh, the second part will uh, maximize the um, sorry, change the objective to maximize the rate of this reaction, and the third part uh, will change the objective to maximize the first reaction. The analysis here. And it will put a constant on the uh, on this reaction, and it will choke it to have a maximum rate to forward to one. And as the analysis function, you can basically use any function that you have. We are using to, uh, the screen optimize objective, which just optimizes the model, runs the linear optimizer on the model, and gets the optimal uh, objective value of the model. So uh, in the result, uh, this actually runs three analyzes three flexible balance analysis here. Uh, from the first with the analyze maximized, we get a value of objective almost 20. So now we, we get that, uh, we get the information that we, if we maximize this uh, reaction at the mo most extreme rate can run at is 12, almost 20. Uh, the most extreme rate this ATP can run at is like almost 175. And we also get the information that if we do this and this modification together, in this small list of modification joined to each other here, we actually get nothing, which means that the model wasn't able to optimize itself to a steady state. Uh, there's a second function which does a very similar thing, but a bit uh, more complicated way. Uh, the screen function processes many complicated model variants at once, uh, and it always recreates the optimization model in jump, uh, which is done for a very simple reason. If your variants would destroy this model structure in jump, uh, this screen uh, function would very easily recreate it for you. So you don't need to think about uh, recreating the changes here. Uh, it works very easily. Uh, you run the function, which is called screen, you give it the model. Uh, 
Um, then you give it an analysis function. For example, here we will be seeing, uh, seeing the um, seeing the viability for all gene knockouts of some model. So we will run an analysis that takes a model and a gene. Uh, then we run a flux balance analysis uh, that has one modification which actually knocks out the gene. And if uh, the uh, if the flux balance analysis works out, and particularly if it doesn't return nothing, which would mean the model has failed, then we return the growth rate of the model. Um, the analysis here is a function which gets repeated for all the arguments and all the variants of the model that the screen function can gather. In uh, this particular case, we got the arguments for the analysis, which are the genes for all G in genes M, which basically means for all genes in the model. Um, uh, from that, we got a vector with one uh, number here for each gene in the model. And the number in the vector means uh, the uh, growth rate of the model with the gene knockout. So we get uh, basically well, a score for the gene number one knocked out, gene number two knocked out, gene number three knocked out, and so on, so on, so on. But from that, you can very easily see, for example, which gene is most important for the model growth and which is also probably least important for the model growth. You can probably see that uh, the genes here and here <coughs> uh, do not quite play a uh, um, very, uh, very, um, very, what is it called? very important role for uh, the growth of the model in the, in the steady state condition that we have found it in, because the steady state doesn't basically doesn't change from the optimum that we got normally. Um, from the higher point of view, it looks like this. You've got several parameters or some well, list of vector or metrics or specifications of what you want to do. You put it in the screen. The screen takes the analysis functions, calls them as needed. There is a lot of optimization here, actually. For example, it does not recreate the model all the time, but clearly, well, smartly recreates it only when needed. And uh, out of that, you get a list of the um, a list of the results for all these all these analyses that uh, you have run, and uh, from that you can uh, well see the things. For example, from that you can see the growth rates in here. Uh, once more, this is colored. You take the arguments. Uh, these get put in the analysis function. Uh, you can run something that is uh, straightforward, like some straightforward flux balance analysis that we have used before. Uh, you just need to check whether the result is valid or not. And you get this uh, list of all um, production rates of the model uh, for all genes knockout. Uh, this extends very easily. Uh, because Julia allows us to specify matrices very easily, uh, you can very easily specify, uh, this is actually a cube, uh, 3D matrix of all genes uh, with gene triplets. And you can try to uh, run an analysis that knocks out all triplets of genes without any problems. Uh, there's not much more code. You can see that uh, there is just a triplet here instead of a single here. And there is actual three knockouts instead of one knockout here. And you just, well, the rest of the function call is the same. And instead of single gene knockout, you get triple gene knockout. And as a result, you will get the huge matrix of the production rates of the model in the um, in all the situations of triple gene knockouts, which is kind of interesting because it shows how the screen function extends to uh, contain more complicated data and comp contain more complicated analysis shapes and uh, tasks. We again need to check for this, there's nothing here. Uh, and this extends even more. Uh, for example, uh, to the screen function, you can pass variants. Uh, if you would like to check out, uh, for example, how uh, the model would behave without uh, how metaboloid removed from the whole model, from the whole processing, uh, there's a modification for that. Uh, you can actually specify it in variants of the model. And again, the screen function will transparently work on all these variants with this analysis function uh, that you have specified here, which is again the same as we had there. And you will get the information, for example, that the model won't uh, even be able to exist without having water inside of the cell, uh, which is kind of expectable. Uh, surprisingly, it would be able to exist with water in uh, outside of the cell in the external compartment, which is also surprising, but the model says so. Um, the key takeaway here is that uh, in Cobrexa, there are several types of functions that can very easily modify the analysis for you. And if you combine those with uh, screen and screen optimal model, uh, screen optimal model modification, 
applications and for example flux variable optimizer with correction envelopes you can very easily modify the behavior of these functions to actually do something extra to the analysis that could be uh, very relevant to your scientific task to your research for example for screening the various gene knockouts and their behavior under different conditions uh, uh, the second key takeaway is that it doesn't it seriously doesn't take much coding uh, you just specify the variance in the list and you, you got it done uh, important question now is does it scale like is, is this even fast here we have produced a matrix that has like five million uh, five million uh, elements the question is how quickly can you that to the cat can you get to this result and the answer is uh, the actual main point of cobrexa uh, cobrexa is created to allow you to very easily read the resources from high performance computing and get this done as quickly as possible with all the hardware that you have uh, in particular, uh, what you would usually do if you would like to use the high performance computing infrastructure, uh, you would get a, you would get to a situation like here. Uh, someone, probably your institution or uh, well, your administrator, to tell you that you got an access to a HPC cluster, which looks like well, a huge heap of computers. Uh, he would tell you that there is an access node that you can use to actually uh, well work with the cluster and schedule analysis in the cluster and uh, it is actually very likely that you already have access to one because there is a lot of a uh, lot of programs a lot of scientific centers that are giving the uh, well this a uh, possibility to the researchers if you ask around you very very likely getting uh, uh, some information about uh, how to access one of these huge machines uh, and the biggest part of Cobrexa is that if you construct the analysis like we did with the screen there, uh, then uh, your analysis is uh, prepared for running on the HPC just for well for no cost. Uh, you just need to enable the parallelization in uh, in Julia to uh, get the whole task distributed correctly, which is in Julia actually pretty easy. Uh, there is a package called distributed, which does all the magic for you. Uh, you call a function which is called add processes, add procs here. You add any number of processes you want. Uh, from that, you will get the list of workers. I'm calling a W here, uh, which will contain something like PIDs of the processes. It will very likely contain just 10 like small numbers that kind of uh, mark for Julia where the computers are. And if you are on flux very better on the screen or any other function, you just pass the this list of PIDs of the workers for you. Uh, you just pass it as a keyword argument workers. It will very transparently, very efficiently um, uh, distribute itself across any workers you give it to. So uh, in the high view, uh, if you are on the screen, if you pass the workers in, uh, the screen will actually create the manual as this task it needs to do it will distribute it across the work nodes for you collect the results for you and you will get the same result in well much less time than uh you would uh, you would probably if you would do, be doing in a single computer uh, the scalability of this process is pretty good uh, if you are running huge analysis uh, um, on very big models, I got, uh, well, we did some benchmarking on community or uh, community models that contain many organisms. This uh, has uh, 50 organisms, which translates to uh, roughly uh, several hundred thousands of uh, individual reactions in the model. Uh, then you will, uh, well, if, if you do not go to the distributed setting, if you run the stuff on the uh, on a single core, for example, you won't get much speed up against, uh, for example, uh, Cobra Pi or other, other uh, Cobra packages. On the other hand, uh, Cobrexa allows you to continue the scaling, the scaling much, much, much behind the uh, usual limit of the scaling of the packages that, for example, cannot support the distribution uh, to multiple computers. Because well, the CPU count here, which is around 16 or 30, is usually the maximum amount of CPUs you can stuff into one computer. Uh, a Cobrex just allows you to dodge this limit and continue scaling with the adapt edit horizontal resources in the HPC in the distributed way. Uh, in particular, on the big model we had here, which has uh, like 100,000, uh, 100,000 or several hundred thousands of reactions on i think this was on four cpus the whole thing for cobra exam cobra pi basically any other cobra package took ten thousand uh seconds which is three hours if i compute correctly and if you if you just continue throwing resources to that from the hpc allocating more and more cpus to that you can very easily get to a 
waiting times, which are, uh, I guess, uh, more reasonable. It's not three hours anymore, but here in this case, it's like 400 seconds, which is basically five minutes. That's something that you uh, can probably wait for. And one of the biggest things about Cobrexa is that we put a lot of optimization into the process of distributing the tasks and distributing the model data across the, uh, across the uh, cluster. Uh, and uh, this line actually goes down pretty nicely with edit resources, especially if uh, the model size is bigger, which is nice because uh, in the result, your analysis won't, well, given enough hardware, your analysis won't ever take more than, well, several hours to compute, uh, which uh, can probably give you some speed up during the research uh, because, well, for example, the results will be um, available quicker. Um, how to actually do that? Um, we are using Slurm, this Slurm uh, workflow manager on HPC here. So I will be using uh, this as a very small um, example of how to, well, technically make the HPC work for you. Uh, there are other workflow managers on different HPCs, but uh, I think that uh, structure of the, of the wor well, uh, workflow will be basically the same. Uh, except for some comments like the SRN here will be replaced. You will probably uh, find that on the documentation of your uh, workflow manager. Uh, so how we are using that, uh, the common workflow in, on HPC is that the first you need to move the data to a cluster. There are ways to do that, usually using some SCP, which copies the data uh, through the SSH connection. Then you connect to the cluster, uh, which is again using standard Unix command. Uh, then you get some allocated resources. This is a critical step because here you're using some a comment from Slurm, uh, Slurm run, uh, where you actually ask it to give an interactive job with uh, uh, 128 nodes, so uh, each of one same CPU, and that would take one hour to compute and give you a shell. Uh, then you start Julia. Uh, use a nice package which is called Cluster Manager, which allows you to kind of read the resources that are given you by this allocation of resources here. Uh, and you call the right function to get the process, processes to get the worker nodes from the worker manager you have used. Uh, in this case, we are using Adprox Slurm. And then you continue like normally. You can load the model, run the flux variable that analyzes with the workers, and you will get transparently the speed that you want. Uh, if you want to do it a bit more uh, normally, uh, in particular, uh, if, well, if you allocate 128 CPUs here in this point, and then wait until Julia starts and then wait until the co-breaks and customer and just actually load, then you would be occupying pretty lot of computing resources that would that couldn't do nothing in the time. So the normal way is to just write a batch script that executes this for you, which might look like this. It specifies the time of the analysis, the number of resources you want. Uh, then it specifies that you actually want to use Julia and run some uh, my own this, the JL script that you will, will use to save your analysis. Well, 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 whatever you want to do with the data, it will look careful like this. And then you can usually schedule it using some kind of uh, scheduler, which is uh, well shipped with your workload manager. In the case of a Slurm, it is usually this uh, program as batch. You give it the script that runs the analysis. It will schedule it, uh, put it in the queue, and when there are enough resources, which may take some time, it will get uh, it will get scheduled. It will get executed for you, and you, you will get the results. For example, overnight if the analysis is long. Uh, the best thing about this is that uh, you, you don't occupy the kind of interactive queue, and you don't occupy the resources while you are typing on the keyboard. But everything gets auto executed automatically, very efficiently. Uh, which is uh, not only better for the cluster because less resources are wasted, but also better for you because you don't need to kind of attend the job, see the work done, but you can just let it run overnight and get the results in the morning. And that is probably, uh, well, less uh, less time consuming than just, you know, watching the terminal while it's computing. Uh, what is happening in the uh, in the background, uh, just so that uh, you, you know what actually gets done by screen, what are the optimizations? Uh, screen does several interesting things that actually make these parallel analysis and distributed analysis very quick. It manages the data very carefully so that the communication and communication volume between the workers is minimized because in HPC, the usual problem is that you have more 
uh, computing power than the communicating power because the computers are just too far from each other. Um, so it very carefully moves the data to the workers, uh, does it very efficiently. Uh, it prepares the analysis functions and precompiles them on the workers, also copies any data that is needed for the analysis functions to the workers. It packs all the variants and arguments and the modification functions, all the recipes to small pieces of data. And then it starts a dynamic to basically dynamically schedule all the tiny pieces of data, all these task descriptions on the workers that are available. And in the result, uh, it's just fills the work use of the workers and uh, well, or kind of organizes, orchestrates the execution of these uh, many diverse tasks. And in, uh, in the end, it just collects all the results that it gets from the workers. It puts them into the result array and gives the result array to you, uh, which looks simple, but actually it is the way that power uh, well, you see many of the many of the viable analyses also FBA is actually internally implemented this, and uh, because of this extensible, you can uh, using the screen function uh, very easily utilize all these optimizations, all this scheme here uh, to power any of your analyses that are uh, expressible in there and uh, well, compute your uh, metabolic modeling problems using that on the HPC. Uh, the key takeaway here uh, that uh, you should uh, kind of remember from here is that uh, uh, now the parallelizable stuff can be accelerated just by adding a bit more workers and just by specifying the uh, specifying the um, analysis in a way which is kind of uh, not restricted but more constructive uh, uh, and uh, can be used by the Cobra uh, com, sorry Cobra uh, code. Uh, to actually run the analysis very efficiently on the workers. In particular, if you build the um, if you build the uh, function analysis functions from the building blocks that we have, um, you will transparently get the uh, get the power of all the hardware that you get there. You will not be limited by the performance on the single computer. And uh, as a very nice benefit of Julia, as you might have probably seen already in the graph. Uh, even a pretty huge models can be processed very efficiently. We had luck with uh, models that have like millions and millions of reactions. And uh, we actually didn't try the larger ones yet, but I'm planning to do that. Uh, if you want to learn more, you can learn uh, You can learn from Cobrex's documentation. We got uh, pretty extensive documentation. We got very extensive documentation of all functions in Cobrex uh, with the doc, doc strings and code. Uh, we also got, uh, I guess, seven, yeah, seven basic and advanced tutorials that show various aspects of uh, using Cobrex or uh, using all the functions bit of bit in context. Uh, we also have uh, nine extensive notebooks that show the whole thing in a kind of more hands-on approach that you can actually run on your computer and see how it behaves. Uh, there's also a manuscript that is now in bioarchive. Uh, you can read about these. Uh, about these reasons also there. Uh, there are also several interesting benchmarks in there that compare to other software and kind of show how and why uh, apply Cobrex to huge scale metabolic modeling. Um, what to expect in the future? Uh, as you might have noticed that, uh, well, what we have parallelized is basically the kind of outer kind of parallelism. We are scheduling the task parallelly on the workers, but we are not actually parallelizing the uh, simplex-based modeling that is somewhere inside uh, in the solvers that we are running. Uh, unfortunately, this is hard to parallelize, and the performance of simplex-based models that solve the actual problem instances is, well, uh, in my opinion, unpredictable at best. Uh, also, uh, we have hit many analysis and analysis methods that would require something more advanced, like uh, quadratic bounds and quadratic objectives in these kind of models that were built for linearity, which is getting complicated. Actually, uh, it gets very uh, computation infeasible very quickly. Uh, but that is uh, the topic of current research. We hope to um, well apply some interesting new methods to solving these complicated models. And hopefully, we get some results soon out very quickly. And that's it. Uh, thank you for the uh, thank you for uh, listening to this. Uh, if you have any questions, there is a button in the Zoom interface that you can use to type the questions. And uh, that is it from me, I guess. Uh, 
Also, there's information about next webinars that you can attend that uh, are going to be about Mabel, so Selenon, Carnival, and many other simulations that are kind of tangential to uh, the metabolic modeling that we have here now. Thank you, Mirek. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Uh, yes, here you have put already the slide of the next webinars that uh, participants can already register visiting our website. Um, meanwhile, we can, we have a, for the moment, we have a question which is says, uh, hello, how can we integrate omics data with the model in Julia? Um, depends on what kind of omics data. Uh, the usual type of data that we are getting that is from the genomics and proteomics is the amounts of proteins in the cells. Uh, you can actually integrate this very easily by just choking and unchoking the reactions uh, based on what protein and what gene is, uh, is measured by the omics. Uh, um, I'm not sure if there is a function for that out yet, but uh, I'm certainly planning to do something similar. So it, 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 it's probably going to appear if it's not there yet. Okay, see, uh, the, the, the person uh, specified transcriptomics and proteomics. So, um... Just to let you know the functions that they are. <laughs> yeah, uh, depends a bit on how, how you can actually interpret the, you, you know, for example, the repeat counts and uh, protein protein counts and protein volumes in the context of metabolic modeling. There's, you, you know, uh, you can actually interpret it in very various ways, many various ways. Uh, the most straightforward way that I would say could be valid but I'm not a biologist, would be just, you know, setting the uh, reaction rates on limiting the reaction rates based on the amount of genes, amount of proteins, based on the amount of reads of the RNA or whatever, uh, to actually reflect the situation in real cell. Uh, but this would probably need some kind of review of the literature. Uh, it would be probably very easy to translate into, into these modifications and uh, variants of the models, but I would need to return that. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question. The participant also says thanks for answering. Any other questions? If not, uh, we have reached uh, the hour already. Um, so uh, thank you, Mirek, uh, very much again for, for your presentation and for your time. And uh, to everyone, see you soon in the next uh, permit webinar. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Goodbye.